Welcome you to Long Hollow if you're here in the worship center or you're worshiping online in the chapel or you're tuning in one of our campuses in Walker State Prison or in Trousdale, we welcome you to Long Hollow or one of the Pando apps uh, around the country. Last week, Candy and I were standing in the line and somebody came through and said, hey, I just want you to know I watched you last week on the Pando app in Sumner County Jail and I'm here this Sunday. Is that crazy? Gave his life to the Lord last week, came. So praise God, uh, God is moving there as well. Today we're going to attempt in the next hour and a half to, I mean, yeah, it, it's going to take, it really should take that. We're going to try to make sense of the millennium, right? Like Revelation is known for a couple of things, tribulation, rapture, millennium, Ar uh, Armageddon. So we're here where some of you have been anticipating us to get. And before I get into the text, I, I was thinking this week, you know, in life, sometimes we believe certain things just because that's what we were taught, or the masses believe it, so it's gotta be right. Uh, for example, when I was growing up, I was taught if you get into the pool within 30 minutes of eating, eating, you will sink to the bottom. How many people believe that growing up, or still believe that, right? I did some research, not true, right? Even though everybody else believes it, it's not true. Uh, also, did you know that bats are not blind? Who knew? Or that dogs are not colorblind? or that bulls do not hate red, or better yet, my favorite, if you crack your knuckles, you will develop what? Arthritis. None of those are true, right? None of those are true. But, but the reality is we have believed them. Why? Because everybody else has believed that. Now, uh, those are funny examples, obviously, but I think it has to do with the message today, and it will apply to the text today as we start. For years, like you, I was taught that Revelation is a book about the return of Christ uh, in the end times, that Jesus is going to come back after the, the rapture, and he's going to come back to earth, and he's going to physically live on earth. He's going to reside in Jerusalem in a temple, receive sacrifices and offerings for a literal thousand-year reign. And then after that, he will create the new heavens, the new earth, send the Satan, the dragon, the beast into the lake of fire, and that'll be it. That's what most of us in here were taught or believe at this point. Amen? That's what I was taught. Now, today, I want you to consider another perspective. And again, it's different, but I want you, last week, how many people still have their glasses from last week? Let me clean mine. These are the 30,000 foot non-presupposition, non-predisposed doctrinal glasses that we put on just for the next 40 minutes, okay? For the next 40 minutes. Everybody got their glasses? We're going to look at a different perspective. Are we okay? Sir, put your glasses on. You got now. my own. No. Okay, so here's what I want you to consider. And again, when I'm trying to study Revelation, I try to just as me, get out of the echo chamber of all the commentaries written in the 19th and 20th century. It, that's just what I try to do. And, and what I want you to do today is the same. The mention, okay, just listen. The mention of a thousand years or the thousand year reign is found in one chapter of the Bible and it's mentioned six times. Revelation 20 is the only place in the entire 66 books of the Bible where you will find any mention of the concept or the term thousand year reign. But as you know, entire theological eschatological systems have been built on that one chapter and on those six mentions in the Bible. Now, because of that, we've have had offshoots of what it means and a lot of systems have been built, but there are really three systems that everybody knows. I'm gonna put these on the on the screen, I don't have time to unpack them. I'll do it in the Sermon Plus that will be released, I promise, this Wednesday. But there's a lot to cover. But what we're going to do is just show you this, and I want you to take your phone and tap the disc in front of you. And then when you tap the disc, it'll pull up a website. Scroll down to the bottom, and you can download this chart, and you can look at it later. But let me just summarize. What I just described is called premillennialism, meaning pre on the front of the millennium, thousand years, or thousand Pre means Jesus is going to come back on the front end. You will reign with Jesus on earth for a thousand years or live and die, and then the end will happen. That's what this view is. The amillennial view, which basically means thousand, when you put an A in front of it, it negates it. For example, atheism means no theos, God. That's what it means, no God. Amillennialism means no millennium, but it gets a bad rap because it doesn't mean there's no millennium. It just means that we're already in the millennium. What amillennialists believe is that after Jesus went to heaven or ascended, that's when the millennium, which is a symbolic 
which I think symbolic, started then and will end when Jesus comes back. Jesus is coming back, amen? But it's gonna be at the end. Now, post-millennialism is very similar to amillennialism with one major difference. And here's the major difference. Amillennialism says, let me start here, Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and then from that point on until the end, things get progressively worse. Let me just give you my cards. I move from here to these two. And by the way, I could go either way, depending on the day I wake up, I go either way. I really wanna believe this to be true and there's a lot of evidence for it. And by the way, when you're hearing that, you're probably saying like I did. Two years ago, if you would've told me I'm an amillennialist, heretic, that's why you say, heretic. And then I started studying the Bible, like for myself, because I just had a lot, I'm not saying you're a heretic if you believe these things or if you don't believe these things. But what I'm saying is I had to study for myself. And you don't have to believe my opinion. It would be helpful if you did. But it, <laughs> I'm serious about that. You just have to have your own opinion, okay? So the reality is all three of these are viable options, okay? You can find some, of this, some from each of these in the text. Now, before I begin to explain what I believe the millennium is, let me say this, a couple of things. And I want you to hear all of this. As I study this now for a, a season of time, what I've realized is, Godly, loving God, well-meaning, spiritual Christians, men and women, are on all sides of the fence. We are not debating here a salvation issue, whether it's you go to heaven or not, or you have a relationship with Jesus for eternity or not. We're not talking about that. Meaning, you and I, I want you to hear this. You and I can agree to disagree and still go to the same church, okay? You need to hear that, right? This is not an issue of truth or heresy. It's not an issue of conservatism or liberalism. It's not an issue of the Bible being inspired or not. None of those things are, 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 are what we're talking about here. Secondly, none of these systems, this is crucial, are locked tight. There are holes in the best of it. And believe me, I have tried and tried to plug a hole. I had a guy in the line last week. Well, what, about the, what about Ezekiel's temple and the book of Ezekiel for the end times? That's a great question. I don't have a good answer to. Right? What about Zechariah? I, that's a great question. I don't have a good answer to. So none of these systems are infallible. In fact, I would say the only thing, you got to realize, when we're trying to interpret apocalyptic literature 2,000 years removed from the day it was written, which is what we're doing, and human error is in, in a part of it, it is up for interpretation. Let me remind you, the only thing that's inerrant and infallible is this book, not me. By the way, it's not you either. This book is infallible and inerrant. So we have to understand and, and look at what this book says. So I want you to put on your glasses. We're gonna look at another perspective, high level, Revelation 20, verse one. If you're there, we like to say, word at Long Hollow. The word of the Lord. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and the great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil. By the way, this is the first time we see the word dragon after it disappeared in chapter 12. So the dragon is glaringly gone from 12 to 20. That ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for, here it is, a thousand years. So Satan is bound for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until... The thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short, 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 <laughs> New Orleans accent, sorry. <laughs> I was, this is a true story. Yesterday I was working on how do I pronounce the word quarter? Because it's quarter, but in New Orleans we say French quarter. But anyway, that's just me, right. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, Lord, keep us focused. We need, we need help today as we study your word. And we want to learn, God. We need help to discern what this means for our life. Years ago, I used to say I'm a pan-millennialist. That's funny, but that's not helpful. There is something crucial in this text that will unlock something in our spiritual life that I believe today will change the course of the way we live for the rest of it. So speak to us now. Help us to focus and learn in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, 
Amen. Okay, the first point, which I have a lot, uh, is not going to be shared right now. You're going to have to kind of cliffhanger. You're going to have to turn in, tune in Wednesday for the sermon plus. But I will give you the point of this point. And we've already talked about this a lot, but I'm going to squeeze this turn up until there's nothing left on, on the sermon plus. Here's point number one. All numbers in Revelation are to be viewed first and foremost symbolically, period. I was... I was waffling early on. I was almost convinced halfway through. I'm convinced. I could be wrong, but I'm convinced. All of the numbers, all of them, have to be interpreted symbolically, not literally. You'll have to tune in this Wednesday for that. Number two is where we'll spend the rest of our time with two and three. Number two, and this is crucial, the reign of Jesus Christ started, began after he came to earth. After Jesus came to earth and started his ministry, that's when the inauguration of the reign of Jesus Christ began. I'll show you a couple scriptures, one of which is the beginning of the book of Revelation. And again, I'll give you some rapid fire scriptures. You can go back and study them, unpack them. But this is how John starts the book, Revelation 1. And the book is written about Jesus from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of of the kings. That's saying today, he is the president over every president. He is the king above every other king that's out there on the earth. To him, to those who love him, are free from their sins. All right, that's number one. So Jesus is ruling and reigning now as king. Number two, a second one we see is Ephesians chapter one, verse 20. This is a little clearer. God exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead, so that was past and seating him or seating him at his right hand in the heavens. This is the question. Seating him at his right hand, is that something gonna happen in the future or did that happen in the past after he was raised? What do you think? Audience participation. It's in the past. So the moment Christ was raised, God gave him the seat to his right hand. Now, what does that mean? That means Jesus is far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given. Here's what he's saying, every title given. He's saying he's, he's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's the emperor of all emperors. In fact, you come up with every other name. He, he's above every Islam sheikh in the world. He's above every um, false prophet. He's the top of the top. Does that make sense? He's above all of it. When did that happen? After he was raised. Dominion authority in this age and they come. And he subjected, here it is, all things, everything. On, you're going to love this word. Th say that with me. Everything. Say it like you mean it. Everything. everything. You know what that word means in Greek? It's interesting. It means everything. Everything is under his feet, right? And God appointed him as head over, say it with me. Everything for the church. What that means is Jesus is ruling and reigning now. In case you forgot, Jesus reminds the guys before he left. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus called the disciples to himself, and then he said, all, <laughs> don't have to tell you because we already studied that, all authority has been given to me where? In heaven and on earth. Now, you got to realize, authority in this text and the text I read is not promised to him at the end of the age or during the millennium, which is what I've always believed, but this is what he's saying here. Jesus Christ, according to these texts, is ruling and reigning when? Now, both in heaven and on earth. And whatever position you hold, pre, uh, post, whatever position you hold, you and I have to agree that Jesus Christ is in control now. Don't you agree with that? Now. Now, what does that do for us? It changes the way we look at life. I want you to get this. We don't live as defeated victims on our back heels waiting for the shoe to drop at any moment. That's the one thing I want you to leave Revelation with. If you get nothing else, that's the main point. No, we're on the winning team, Long Hollow, of a king who secured our victory on the cross of Calvary. Can I get an amen? And the way we change the world from the one who changed the world is we enact change through the preaching of the gospel or the good news of Christ. Now, you probably say, I don't know if I, I understand that. How many people in here believe that God can, because you have autobiographical experience, but God can change anyone at any time, anywhere? Who believes that? Show of hands, okay? If you don't raise your hand, it's probably because it hadn't happened to you. But if it happened to you, 
You're like, I know. <clears throat> now this change may not happen in, in a culture or a country right away, but you will see this transformation in a family immediately. You'll see this transformation in a marriage immediately. You'll see this transformation in your community immediately. You'll see this transformation in the church immediately. Why? Because when people surrender to Jesus individually, it changes the community around them corporately. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, we're all on the same page there. Yes? Okay. So let me prepare you. What I'm about to tell you is going to seem odd. So I want you to be prepared. It's going to seem really odd, but I want you to stay with me till I give you the reasoning. <laughs> Revelation 20, I don't think, happened chronologically after Revelation 19. I actually think it came before Revelation 19 chronologically. Now, before you say, I don't know what you, let me just remind you of what happens in 19 and 20 so we are on the same page. Revelation 19, for the past two weeks, we learned that Jesus is going to return at the end, and Jesus is going to ride on a white horse with victory and the saints, and they're going to celebrate, and linen, we learned last week, they're not in military clothes, they're not in fatigues, they don't have swords, the battle's already been won. We learned that when Jesus comes back then, he's gonna make all things right, and then eventually he'll make the new heavens and the new earth. And then in 20, we learn about this church age, this period of time where the gospel will advance and Christ will be reigning and ruling as king. Now, before I show you how I think it's out of order, let me remind you, Revelation, we've learned, is not chronologically written. I know this bothers some people, it's hard to swallow, but we learned this in Revelation chapter 12. Do you remember this text a few weeks ago, a few months ago? I made the case that Revelation 12, which was the dragon, the woman, and the child, remember this, was a Christmas Eve text. What do I mean? The text was about Jesus coming to earth, being born of Mary, a virgin. And I made the case that Revelation 12 had to be written before Revelation 1 through 11. In fact, I would say Revelation 12 was written before John was even born, who wrote it? because it was written about the birth of Jesus. So we're learning, and this is hard for us, why? Because in our Western American Roman Hellenistic influence packaged mind, where everything is sequential and orderly, it bothers us. Does that bother anybody? It, bother, it bothers me, because I like to have things in an orderly fashion, but John's not a Western American preacher. John's a Middle Eastern Jewish Hebraic a student of a rabbi who is reporting, don't miss this, not what happens next, but what he sees next. And I told you this early on. For John, what he sees next is the key, is not necessarily what happens next. Think of it like a movie with different scenes that pop up. So he sees this scene and then it changes. And then he sees this scene and then it changes. And notice what John says. John's favorite word in Revelation is saw, S-A-W. Remember? And then I saw. And then I turned and saw, and then I turned around and, and saw. He doesn't say this, and I think if he would have said this, it would prove that he was, or at least give nod to chronological. He doesn't say this, he could have. And after this happened, then this happened. And after this happened, that happened. That's sequential, that's logical, big difference. Again, we also encountered this in Revelation 6 and 7. Remember Revelation 6 is all the plagues and the destruction of the seals. And then we get to Revelation 7, and it says, almost like God forgot, or John forgot, he's like, oh, by the way, none of the saints, the 144,000 and the, and the multitude of saints, none of them will be affected by the plagues. Why? Because I, watch this, sealed them before. So Revelation 7 happened before Revelation 6, 6 chronologically. So here's my point, all that to say. I believe the millennial reign of Jesus in Revelation 20, number one is not literal, it's symbolic, but I believe it happened before Revelation 19. In fact, I would say it this way, Jesus' reign and rule was inaugurated after his temptation. You're saying, really? How, how after the temptation? He hadn't died yet. Now, when he dies and resurrects and ascends, it fully is realized, but it started after his temptation. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I want to show you this. Mark chapter 1, 14, Jesus is going to say the first words publicly to inaugurate his ministry. And I want you to see what Jesus says. Mark chapter 1, right out the gate, Mark starts this way. After John was arrested, and you want a Bible because you're going to want to see what I say next. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming, say it out loud, the 
Good news. You know what another word for the good news is? Gospel. Good news, gospel. That's the key word there. The gospel is this. The time is fulfilled. Do you know what that means? It's done. It's already happened. It's here. And the kingdom of God is 2,000 years away. It's not what it says. What does it say? The kingdom of God has what? Come near. And remember, the kingdom of God is the ways and, and the promises and the lifestyle of heaven realized on earth. That's what it means, okay? The kingdom of God has come near. He's saying it's right here. So therefore, repent and believe the good news. That is the entrance into the doorway of the kingdom. Now, here's the point. The reason we miss that is frankly because we don't fully understand what the good news message or a gospel message was back then. So let me take you back on a journey to the ancient times. Whenever a country or a king would win a battle, they were at battle, they were always battling. Whenever a king or a kingdom would win a battle, it was important to get the news of the victory to the people who lived in the kingdom. And they couldn't do it, by the way. They didn't have X. I don't know if you know. <laughs> they didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Snapchat. They didn't have, you know, the news media. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have any of that. What they had was horseback. So guys would be sent on the back of horses to every town in the empire with a message to, to the townspeople. Anyone who would listen, they'd get to the town, they would stand up on top, normally a stone, or they would sit on the back of their horse, and they would yell, I got the gods, I got good news. The victory is ours. We won. Now watch this. That's what it means to deliver a message of good news. Now how do I know Jesus is saying this because Jesus begins his ministry, watch this, put it back up, by saying Jesus brings to you, no, back up, one more, sorry. Jesus brings to you the good news of God. Another way to say it is the victory of God. What is it? The time has come, the kingdom of heaven is not near, here. The kingdom of heaven, I want you to get this, Jesus is saying, is being ushered in now. Now, how do I know that? because of what happened right before. Look in your Bible. I want you to see what happens right before Jesus began preaching this message. <laughs> what did he do? What did he accomplish? Well, Mark tells us, look what he says. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Now what Mark leaves out that Matthew and Luke don't is he won. <laughs> Mark forgot that, but he, he implies it. He was with the wild animals and the angels were serving him. So what happens in this text? Jesus is in the wilderness, the devil is tempting him, and what happens? Jesus emerges victorious. Why is, that, why is that essential? Why is that crucial? Because every single man before Jesus who attempted to battle the devil in the wilderness failed miserably. Adam tried it with God in the garden, he failed. Moses picks up the mantle, he fails. Joshua goes into the land, he fails. The people go into the wilderness, they fail. And yet Jesus goes in for 40 days, just like the rest, and he comes out victorious. Here's what he's saying. I beat the devil. And then watch this. For the rest of his ministry, what does he do? He decimates Satan. Watch this, you're gonna love this. After that, he'll find a man that's filled with a demon. He's like, get out, you demon, right? Let's cast him out. He finds a woman with seven demons, he casts her out. He finds someone with an illness, he heals them. He finds someone with disease. What he's showing is he is binding Satan once and for all. Satan is defeated. Now, it's not fully realized until the resurrection ascension, but that's when the kingdom is inaugurated. Now, at this point, for those who... No revelation. Here's the major pushback you're going to tell me, and it's a good one. Okay. If Revelation 20 is right, verse 3, and it said that Satan was bound, threw him in the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so he would not no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. If you believe, Robbie, that Revelation 20 happened in the past, which I do, then how in the world are you saying to me Satan is bound right now in the abyss and he can't deceive the nations? And the answer is yes. Now here's why. What I told you earlier is Satan is glaringly absent 
from Revelation 12 in the dragon to Revelation 20. Uh, but Satan's not gone from impacting the world. Why? Because he has two henchmen carrying out his evil duties. In fact, we learned about these two not long ago. There is the beast of the sea and the beast of the land. Do you remember this? The beast of the sea and the beast of the land. By the way, it's always twos in Revelation. Two prophets, two men, you know, two of Beast of the sea. The beast of the sea corrupts people um, politically. That's all he's bent on is using politics and government. Boy, we know that pretty well. The beast of the land corrupts theologically. So it takes the truth and distorts it. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, cults. Uh, Islam takes the truth. They start with Abraham in the Bible and they twist it to deceive people. So Satan himself is not out prowling the world according to Revelation 20. He's actually in the abyss and he's using his henchmen to do his dirty work. And the question you're asking is, how is that even possible? How can Satan still be influencing the world and, and though bound? I went on a rabbit trail this week and I started to study the gangster mobster, John Gotti. Anybody remember John Gotti back in the day? Golly, to me on a rabbit trail. Uh, John Gotti was the leader of the Gambino family. Uh, they had a nickname for John Gotti because never, they never could convict him. Teflon Don, right? He just got out of everything. Eventually, 1992, if you study the history, they finally got him. In 1992, they sent him to maximum security prison, and they believed that the enterprise of the Gambino family would cease to exist as we know it, and they were wrong. Why? Because John Gotti in prison had three different people coming to him at all times. And he started to work by proxy, by remote supervision through visitors that came, his son, John Jr., and then his brother who took over uh, the enterprise. They continued to extort. They continued to have racketeering. They continued to have loan sharking. And all of this continued from prison remotely while Gotti was locked up. Coming close. That is exactly what I believe Satan is doing on the earth today. He is still influencing the world through his two henchmen, the beast of the land and the beast of the sea. And, and obviously all that you say, okay, I agree with that. What does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with my life today? I'm glad you asked. This is why I think Revelation 20 is such a crucial passage for every Christian. Number three, and here's the main point. You and I are expected compelled, motivated to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth today. That's what Revelation 20, I think, is about. What if I told you this, and this will catch you a little bit off guard. What if I told you that as a Christian right now, you are presently ruling and reigning in heaven as a believer today? How many people would say, I've never heard that before. I never thought about that before. Well, obviously, we're going to see that in Revelation, but I'll show you in other passages. This is what John's getting at in Revelation 24. Here's what he said. I saw thrones and people seated, all spiritual, on the thrones who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark of the beast. By the way, this is all past in the first century, I think, on their forehead or hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So what does that mean? They came to life spiritually with Christ. I think, according to this, they're reigning in heaven now. And I know you say, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, turn with me to Ephesians 2. This is the most convincing. Ephesians 2, Paul is tackling this exact same argument, and he's saying it from a different perspective. This is the passage in Ephesians where it says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That passage. But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. Pop quiz. Made us alive past tense, present, or some future event long away uh, in the by and by future. What do you think it is? It's a present tense reality 2,000 years ago. So what he's saying is, when you surrender, and, and again, I don't know how this works, but this is what the Bible says. When you are made alive here on earth, you are spiritually, your soul, you're made alive in heaven simultaneously. Even though you're dead in your trespasses, you're saved by grace. Watch this. He also raised us up with him 
past tense, and seated us with him in the heavens, past tense, in Christ Jesus. Why? So that he may in the coming ages display the immeasurable riches of his kindness or grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Here's what's, I don't, I don't understand it all, but this is the reality. Just as Jesus Christ is reigning in heaven, so are we as believers today. Now, I don't understand how that works, but that's what the Bible says. And this is the reason I lean toward the amillennial, postmillennial view. Again, like I told you, I was premillennial up until this series. And if you're premillennial, it's fine. But the reality is you got to know what you believe and you got to believe what you know. But the reason I turn to amillennial or, or postmillennial, which I really want to believe, is this. It's the byproduct, don't miss this, of what it breeds in our mind. I joked in the prayer, it came out early, but I used to say, I'm a pan millennialist. It'll all pan out. Well, that's cute. But that's not what God wants us to believe. Because God wants us, I think, to wrestle with it. And, and here's what I'm gonna show you. The byproduct of your eschatological end time system determines how you live today. What you believe about tomorrow determines how you live today. What you believe about today determines how you live today. For years, I was a premillennial. I had the premillennial view. And if I'm just honest with you, I'll just share my thought process. I lived during that time, 19 years of my Christian life, 20 years, I lived during that time looking for every sign of the times, consciously or unconsciously, on X and Facebook and Instagram and end times prophecy watch lists and every new book out by every guy that I would name and you would know. I, I list, and I got sucked into that. I was trying to discern when the next harbinger in the world would happen. You know what I'm talking about? Or what political uh, system is being enforced or what country is going to war or Israel the time, I was gonna watch Israel or what political candidate gets, gets elected. And here's what I did. I created the epicenter in my life of anxiety. Now, don't shoot me, but listen, you don't have to agree with me on my position, but if you're honest, if you're honest, you're there. Because at any moment, I was waiting for the tipping point of destruction of God's decimation on earth. That's what I was waiting. And at times, I would feel like this. I would think to the Lord, can I really make a difference? Like, what's the point? Like if the whole world is going to Hades in a handbasket, why try anything? I mean, the shoe could drop at any moment. Why try anything? You're going to decimate this place and start over. Who cares? Now, I know that's a little extreme, but that time my mind would go from time to time. But once I understood this, it changed everything for how I live today. Why? Because once you know, coming close, that Jesus is ruling and reigning in heaven on earth today, and that you and I, as a professing Christian, are on the winning team today, and the guy we follow is the king over every king, and the lord over every lord, and the emperor over every emperor, and the president over every president, I'm not fearful like I used to be, amen? Because Jesus is reigning today. Say that with me. Jesus Say today again. Today. Say it like you mean it. Today, that's the key, today. Now, probably you probably say, I don't know if I agree with that. Let me give you one scripture before we close. Jesus gave us a clue embedded in the Lord's prayer before he left. Gave us a clue. And I've said this prayer like you for years, and I missed this clue until recently. Uh, Brandon was telling me, man, that, uh, this is really what got me this morning. Kingdom on earth, really, that kind of got me. And I said, Brandon, that's also a shameless plug for the best book I've ever written, nobody's ever read. It's a true story called Here and Now. If you want a copy, we have boxes in the back. But anyway, <laughs> you know when nobody's reading it? Because nobody, anyway, I'm not going to say, well, I got an idea. I got an idea. I joke, the best, but anyway, nobody bought it. But anyway, verse nine. In this book, I share this concept in, in its entirety, but let me just share a snippet. Jesus gave us this as a prayer, yes, but it's not just things we say from the words of our lips it should be the very mantra of our life. This is a, a rubric, a paradigm to live by. Watch what he says. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your name. Your kingdom come, this is the line, circle this line. Your kingdom come, put one, your will be done, put two, on earth, one, as it is in heaven, two. Or actually, two, one, it's backwards. 
So it's one, two, two, one. Okay, how does it work? It's called in Hebrew a parallelism. Last week I told you a Hebrew concept of what's called an inclusio, which is like a bookmark. This is another high level Hebrew concept, you see it all through the Bible, called a parallelism. Here's what a parallelism is. It's two ideas that are synonymous or equal to one another. So they're basically, it's another way to say the same thing. I'll give you an example. Jesus said, take upon my yoke for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Parallelism, same concept told the same way, two different ways, same concept, two different ways. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my, you know these, that's a parallelism. Same thing said a, a different way. This is the same thing. Jesus is saying here that the kingdom of heaven will come to earth when the people of God do the will of God on earth. I'm telling you, this is profound. This is like the most profound thing I learned years ago and nobody was excited as I was, but I was excited. And I'm like, what? That doesn't, that doesn't compute the way, because I've always thought heaven was there. Like we go to heaven. What do you mean we can bring, and remember heaven is not, don't think flying babies singing, you know, that's not heaven. Heaven is just this, the rule and the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven, God's way on earth. So here's how it works. And this is the whole sermon right here. Don't miss this. When you and I as Christians submit to the will of God in our life today, we bring the kingdom of heaven on earth through our life where we live, work and play. That changes everything. When you and I obey the king and Jesus is ruling and Jesus is reigning, we, let me say it this way, we manifest the kingdom of heaven in our life today. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done, you can see and realize and manifest the kingdom today. And I don't know about you, that changes everything in life for me. You mean to tell me I can bring change today? How many people in here would say, I wanna change the world for God? I really wanna change the world. I think most of us in here would say that. That's why you're here. If you wanna change the world, look at me. Let's start with you. If you're sick of the injustice in the world today, why don't you start acting justly, loving faithfully, and walking humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. How many people would say, I'm sick of the immorality that, that's being uh, shared and showed in the world today? I am too. Well, why don't you personally start running from sin, brother, and seeking holiness before God? Let's start with you, sister. I I'm sick and tired of the cursing and the hate that's spewing online. I am too. Well, let's start looking at the way we speak. Let's, let's start looking at the language we use. Let's start looking at the adjectives, adjectives we modify with. Let's start looking at the anger we project to people. I, I love what the great philosopher Michael Jackson said. He was onto it. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him, profound words. I'm asking him to change his ways. No message could have been any clearer. If you wanna, what does it say? If you wanna take the, make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Here's the thing. If there's no change, nothing changes. Let me say it this way. If nothing, write this down. Nothing changes, then nothing changes. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. You can't come sit here and say, man, I wanna make a change, but nothing changes. So the question is not, as we leave here, is it a literal thousand years or spiritual? That's not the question of Revelation 20. That's a sidebar issue. The main question of Revelation 20 is this, coming close, I want you to feel the way of this. Is Jesus, not is Jesus gonna reign for a thousand years. The question is, is Jesus ruling and reigning in your life today? Today. Pastor, I'm not seeing the kingdom of God in my life. Well, maybe the reason the kingdom's not flourishing is because you're not following the way and the will and the word of God in your life today. That's why you're not bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth today. And the way we do that, and this is how we close, the way we do that is the doorway is what? How do you experience a change? And this is not just for unbelievers, although it is who are far from God. This is for Christians, professing Christians who've gotten off track. What is the doorway? Repentance, which is a turning around. It's like uh, your Maps app saying, turn around, make a U-turn if possible. Make a U-turn, that's what it's saying, that's repentance. You turn back to the Lord. Let me pray for us. And I wanna pray a prayer over you 
Because some of you are like, man, that's me. I, I turn from the Lord. I feel far from God. The intimacy with God is not what it used to be. Or maybe you're here today and saying, man, I'm just far from God in general. Jesus is not ruling and reigning. I'm not asking if you said a prayer. Notice that. I'm not asking that. A lot of us in here said a prayer. I'm asking, is Jesus King and Lord reigning over your life? And if he isn't, man, I, I'm praying. You surrender through repentance and faith today. Let me pray. Lord, I'm going to pray right now. In fact, before I pray, if that's you, just quickly, I'm not going to call you out. We don't have time to come forward. I'm just going to ask you, just slip a hand up and say, pray for me right now. You're talking right. I'm not going to draw this out for time, but just, you know who you are. Just, pastor, pray. Thank you. Hands all over. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. Anyone in the back, in the balcony? Praise God. Anyone else? Be so bold. Pray for me. I need it. Praise God. I see you, sister. Anyone else in the back? Praise God. Hands all over. Praise God. Lord, I'm praying you see and take note of every person who responded. And there's something about stepping out in faith and just acknowledging our need and desire for you. Speak to us now as we sing and worship. Hear our prayer. Receive our offering of worship today. And help us live in a way where you rule and you reign over our lives not only today, but for all eternity. We pray it in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said.